Hello, um, I'm Duncan Lunan. Uh, I'm an honorary member of the Clydesdale Society uh, by profession. I'm a, a science writer specializing in astronomy and space flight. I also write science fiction and I'll, I have an, another book of my collected short stories coming up for publication shortly. Um, what you probably know me for best is the construction of the Site Hill Stone Circle in Glasgow. I'm going to bring up my normal start talk picture at this point. Um, and it should come up now. Here we are. Right, that should do it. Um, so this is me at the Stone Circle, outstanding in my field. This picture was taken by my wife Linda in 2010. You can see the spire of Glasgow University behind me. Uh, this is the original site due north of George Square. The circle has now been removed from it. The whole area is being redeveloped, but as a result of a public campaign to save the circle, it's been re-erected at the eastern end of the old park, and I was commissioned to recalculate the alignments. And everything then is on hold until um, the consequences of coronavirus are sorted out and then there will be an official opening. So the only place you can see it for, at the moment is probably from the motorway bridge at the end of Baird Street, the best view of it, or if that's not open to the public from Pinkston Road itself. Okay, um, what I'm going to talk about is a book that I wrote uh, published in, by Springer in 2013. Um, it was um, the result of a discussion project in, started in what was then Scotland's National Space Flight Society called Astra and finished under the auspices of another educational charity called Active Scale, which has also now been wound up. Um, the project was proposed by uh, one of our past presidents uh, by the name of Bill Ramsey. And the question that he raised was, if we knew there was going to be an impact in 10 years time, what could we do about it? And as a supplementary question out of the options, what would we do? Uh, the reason for saying 10 years time is that uh, by comparison with the seven years from Kennedy's first announcement to the Apollo 11 moon landing, it's not an unreasonable time to get something done. Um, but on the other hand, it's not so long a time that uh, governments can say, we'll leave it to our successors. Decisions have to be taken rapidly, programs have to be started, facilities have to be put in place. Um, so that was the theme of the discussion project, was to explore these issues and see what answers we came up with. Now, one of the distant origins of it was a television series back in the late 1950s called Men Into Space. Uh, Murray Leinster, well-known science fiction writer, did a, a book of it. Um, and it had an episode in which a bunch of astronauts went to an asteroid in order to remove it as a threat from Earth. They planted conventional explosives on the subject surface of the asteroid, detonated them, and it vanished. In spite of the fact that it was it was so big that a substantial part of the plot had to do with the fact that one of the astronauts got lost on it. Um, now, this, even substituting nuclear weapons, as they did in the film Meteor, and again, at the critical moment, they, they detonated the, the bombs and the asteroid just vanished. Um, this is not what's going to happen. In, in real life, um, it, you, you can blow it into lots of bits, but the bits will still be on collision course with Earth. And as Jay Tate of Space Guard UK is fond of saying, um, you have simply swapped a cannonball for a shotgun blast. In fact, the consequences environmentally might be even worse, and they're going to be pretty bad either way. Um, I wrote a story called How to Blow Up an Asteroid back in the early 70s, making some of these points. And that's in my next book, which is called The Other Side of the Interface. Um, going to be published shortly. It's at the publishers now. And 
you'll find the details on my website in due course when we have a publication date. Um, so yes, there's the guys of Armageddon heading off to, to blow it to bits. Not a good idea because the bits are all still going to be heading for Earth as in this artist's impression, which experimentally I'm going to make bigger just to see how that works. Um, and then I have to shrink it down again before I can go on to the next one. So, yeah, in, a, in Armageddon, in fact, the scenes that you get early in the film, um, like the fragments bombarding New York, and later on, a much bigger bit, wiping out Paris, these, these events really want to be at the end of the film, not at the, not at the beginning, um, or, or even in the middle. And back in the 1970s, uh, I chaired a discussion project with an astro which generated two books. One was called New Worlds for Old, subtitled The New Look of the Solar System. And the other was Man and the Planets, subtitled The Resources of the Solar System. We gave a whole chapter to the, the asteroids in each of those books, and among other things, discussed the threat. And the only answer we could see to it back then was industrialization. We reckon the, it, it, the nuclear weapons solution was just no good. Um, and the only answer we could really imagine was to take some kind of gigantic factory ship out to the asteroid, uh, extract its valuable resources, and simply scatter the rest as dust that would, wouldn't do any harm. Things have moved on considerably from there. Um, but before we discuss that, to give you an update, uh, last year, 2019, the International Astronomical Asteroid Defense Committee, uh, part of the IIU, um, held an exercise in which they simulated uh, what they anticipated happening if an asteroid like this was detected and was going to hit the Earth in their time scale. It was going to be in eight years. And they had computed its orbit. Um, from the moment of discovery, circling around the sun um, on an all elliptical orbit, um, grazing uh, out beyond the, the orbit of Mars, and coming back in to a possible impact with the Earth in 2027. They ran through the, the exercise. This was uh, um, un position uncertainty in the, in, in, at the start of the scenario. We'll come back to that later. And it created what they call a red line, a track along which it was possibly going to hit somewhere, crossing the USA and um, going out over Africa, if it, if it, if it either grazed the atmosphere or, or passed extremely close. And it was capable, at, at the size it was, it was about a, a kilometre across, as I recall, dumbbell-shaped. And it was reckoned that it would create a very big swathe of uh, from where it hit, you'd get a, a circle of destruction on the, the, these order of sizes, um, if it hit. As the Senate scenario developed, there's a comparison of the original size of the asteroid with New York. Um, they reviewed a number of mission options, staged a flyboy, flyby mission to find out what its main characteristics were, and then um, by that time they'd pinned down the impact point, which was going to be uh, very close to Denver, uh, with the, these radii of from maximum destruction at the centre ranging outwards. Um, uh, they then fired a missile at it, attempting to deflect it. Um, with, in effect, rocket thrust as, as, the bomb, as the bomb exploded and material on the surface of the asteroid vaporized. They succeeded in shortening the red line to this band um, centered on New York. And that's the scale of the remaining fragments, six large uh, fragments, 60 meters across. And sure enough, 
it hit and did a huge amount of damage on this radius in the city of New York as we know it ceased to exist. And a lot of people who'd been following this exercise as it ran said, was eight years longer than it took to put man on the moon? Couldn't we do better than that? Well, in our scenario, we did. Um, one of the, you very often get the effects of impacts compared to some of the air bursts that have occurred in the last century or more. Um, that's the one over Chelyabinsk, which in Russia, uh, which broke in 2013, which broke a lot of windows, injured a lot of people, but did comparatively little other damage because it exploded high in the atmosphere. The Tunguska object of 1908, of which that's an artist's impression, um, exploded, we don't know exactly how high, but between one and three kilometers above the ground. And, um, but again, it was an air burst on the order of three megatons. Did a huge amount of damage at ground level, but didn't form a crater. Um, and all consequently, the amount of material that was thrown up into the atmosphere was the material of the asteroid itself. And so the late Sir Fred Hoyle wrote a, wrote a book about impacts in which he assumed that this was always going to happen, which is much, much too generous an assumption. But even that, had it happened over, over St. Petersburg, which was, it was on the latitude of, would have caused huge devastation, killed an awful lot of people. Um, that's the blast area of the Tunguska explosion superimposed on central London. And as you can see, it occupies virtually the entire zone within the M25, within which there would be very few survivors, possibly a lot, a lot of bad, very badly injured people in the outer ring. Um, on that scale, there was an object in 1972 which flew across up the United States um, through the atmosphere, low enough to generate some sonic booms. It was reckoned to be about 80 meters in diameter, which is bigger than the one in the 2019 scenario I showed you, uh, a lot bigger. Uh, remember, the mass goes up with a cube of the radius. Um, and it was solidly solid enough to stay intact, although it came low enough in the atmosphere to cause sonic booms. It, I'm trying to zoom in on that. Uh, there we are. It was it was tracked all the way from north to south, as I remember, um, and it was concluded it hadn't hit the ground because seismic effects should have been recorded. Now, uh, if, if something, if an explosion of that magnitude had occurred in the central USA in 1972, I think there would have been military and political effects as well, and we probably wouldn't be here talking about it now. Um, but one of the reasons why the consequences of these events have been underestimated is that on the Earth's surface, craters get erased by weather and other, other effects. And one of the few surviving ones, I think the biggest surviving one, is the Barringer Crater uh, in New Mexico. Um, that was an object of somewhere between 100 and 300 metres diameter, but a nickel iron object, a very dense object, which uh, would proportionately cause an awful lot of damage. And Chesley Bonstell, the space artist, painted that crater superimposed on Manhattan Island. But he's way underestimated the the damage. If you look at if you look at, at it, the bridges, although they're broken, are still recognizable. And the piers are still there and there are still ships visible in the in the in the river. Um it's not going to be like that. Um, he subsequently did a pain, another version of the painting in which he represented it as the result of a nuclear explosion. I think he was being a bit optimistic even then. The big eye on Coney Island is still standing. Um, and the streets are still there. Um, now, Hiroshima did look a bit like that after, after the explosion, but even at Hiroshima, there wasn't there wasn't a big crater at ground level. Something that actually hits the ground is going to have a far more devastating effect. And in fact, uh, looking at the impact of a hundred meter object 
on on London. You're probably looking at people getting first degree burns all the way out to beyond South End. Um, an object like the uh, Halley's Comet at um, eight miles or so in, de in, in length hitting the central USA would create that kind of pattern of, de of destruction. Um, um, and as for the dinosaurs, uh, that was their last hope. Um, the impact of that object, which was roughly the size of Halley's Comet, um, but so destructive it may very well have been a rock asteroid or possibly even a smaller iron one. We're still not certain about that. But it did a tremendous amount of damage. Um, the thing you don't see in the film Deep Impact, where the big fragment hits, hits the Earth, uh, is the ejector. Um, in Deep Impact, there is an ejector plume at the top of the fireball, uh, which you see, see it briefly from space. But it's not in any of the promotional artwork for the film, and it looks in the film as if it's been added as an afterthought, and it never comes down again. What happened with the Chicxulub impact um, that took out the dinosaurs was that the bombardment of red, red hot or white hot ejector covered the whole planet, and pretty well everything caught that could catch fire did everywhere all over the globe at once. Um, in spite of the fact that a huge amount of water was thrown up. The impact was just off, was off the coast of Yucatan, quite, quite some way off. And a tremendous amount of water must have been thrown up into the atmosphere. What exactly happened to it, nobody's very sure. That's the spreading blast pattern of the Chicxulub impact as it was represented in Armageddon early in the film. And I think one of the most effective moments in the whole film is when the camera goes on over the curves of, curve of the Earth. And as it travels round, it meets the blast wave coming the other way because it, it's covering the, the, the whole of the globe. Um, like, like that, at least within, within the Americas at ground level. Um, and of course, as the, followed by the rain of ejector, which was extremely destructive. And by nightfall, the whole planet was basically in that kind of condition. Um, the last few di dinosaurs di roaring and roaring their defiance, but not doing any good, guys. Um, and there also was a huge ground shock caused by the, the impact. And um, James Lovelock and Michael Allaby calculating this in, um, for a book that they wrote about, about called The Great Extinction, about this event, reckoned that everything on Earth that wasn't nailed down went 10 feet in the air uh, as that ground shock struck. Uh, they reckoned that uh, mammals like us, which were about the size of shrews at the time, thrown 10 feet in the air, would come down and bounce and squeak and survive but dinosaurs would be much worse off. And in fact, we've now got some proof of this with uh, an inland sea um, in North Dakota, which existed at the time. Uh, that went into a condition called Seash, where the water effect effectively staged inland tsunamis forward and back all, um, all, all round it. And uh, notice the upside down Stegosaurus, they actually I found that fossil among the broken trees and the other chaos at the shores of this inland sea. The Stegosaurus has a very no annoyed expression on its face. But this is the kind of fossil bed that they found, total confusion of plants and animals and fish and the upside down dinosaur and, and lots of smaller dinosaurs as well. Uh, and again, this, this was this kind of devastation just due to the earthquake was happening all over the earth. Um, the impact was at sea. They reckon the tsunami was about 100 metres high. This is the only picture I've managed to find of it, estimated view of it online. Not very clear, but it does give you some idea. Um, 
And it was, the height of it would have varied around the world, but it would have been devastating everywhere. If, if San Francisco had in, existed then, it would have looked like momentarily like that, and London like that. Um, it would it was um, a devastating event, killing ninety percent of known species on Earth. Sydney would have looked like that, um, and all the volcanoes in the world would would have erupted at once, as in this painting by Chesley Bonstell, um, with a big ionized column over the impact site. And the water falling into the crater, which originally was something like oh, 25 to 50 miles deep through the crust into the magma, eventually, as it filled up with lava, the sea quenched it. But the amount of water vapor and dissolved solids released into the atmosphere would have covered the planet. Um, there'd been a huge storm um, in the in the Atlantic itself. Um, we've seen this happen with the impacts of Comet Shoemaker Levy on Jupiter. Um, that's one of the Shoemaker Levy impact scar scars superimposed on the Earth to see what it would look like. They were like that on Jupiter, plainly visible in the Airdrie telescope, it's only a five inch refractor, where we could see them like that very clearly um, in the week that it happened in 1994. Um, so, yeah, all of this certainly demonstrates that there is a hazard. Multiple, Im if an object fragments, multiple impacts again can be a, a factor. 1178, Something of that nature was seen on the far, apparently on the far side of the moon, and gave birth, uh, the formation of the crater Giordano Bruno. The monks who witnessed the impact plume said that it, it rose and fell twelve times or more, all in, all in the same spot. Curiously enough, but that's another story. Initially, this is what Chicxulub, the Chicxulub area, would have looked like after the impact. Um, this was. Sydney Jordan's representation of it in the Lance McLean comic strip. Um, this is how the dinosaurs would have represented it if they'd had comic strips. Save yourself, mammal, we will fend off the asteroids. Um, and we are potentially in line for it. It was thought, even in 1984, we were in line for an impact like that. This is Comet Swift Tuttle, the great comet of 1863. Uh, painted by Sidney Jordan from a, a lantern slide lent by the late John Braithwaite. Um, the comet was extremely active. It, um, it's been modelled since and reckoned that there were as many as seven active areas with jets coming off from it. And the plane of the comet's orbit intersects the Earth's orbit, and the debris from the comet spread along that uh, orbital plane uh, we see every year as the Perseid meteors. It was thought in 1984 it might actually hit the Earth. The chances at one point came down to one in 40. It didn't actually turn up again till 1992, and it was a, a nice safe distance away from us. But it, there are going to be two, in the next few centuries, two pretty close passes. It's now reckoned that it will not actually hit on either of those occasions. But if it did, it would be very bad indeed. The nucleus is 26 miles across, um, much bigger than the uh, Chicxulub event. And uh, life, life in the deep smok smokers in the ocean bed might survive, nothing else. Um, and then again, of course, there was Comet Hale Bob, which was 80 miles across. The technology to deal with comets simply does not exist. Speaking at a seminar we organized during our project, the late Dr. Arthur Hodkin said, you're going to need Star Trek technology. Uh, you're going to need tractor beams and space worms and technology on that level to deal with comets. Uh, the late Andy Nimmo and I begged him not to start his talk with that. He very nearly lost his scientific audience. But uh, he went on to some much more and a much more valuable contribution we'll talk about in a little bit. Oh, this is the 
So at that er at an early stage of the incoming asteroid project, we said, okay, no, no comments. Uh, we'll definitely say our impactor is an asteroid. Now the asteroid belt surrounds the sun between the orbits of Mars and Jupiter with two concentrations of objects at the Lagrange points for the sun, Ju sun and Jupiter. They're no problem. Um, objects from the main belt can be deflected sufficiently to cross Earth's orbit in collisions or other mutual encounters. And they are a major danger. You've got three classes of what are called Earth grazing objects or near Earth objects. There's the orbit of Mars, there's the orbit of Earth, and you have got Amor class objects which don't come within the, the orbit of the Earth, and Apollo class objects which cross the orbits of both Earth and Mars, and you have got Atens which orbit completely within the orbit of Mars and can pass between the Earth and the, the Sun. So um, we were going to make our object one of those. We were coming to the conclusion that what we needed was a designer hazard. We would make um, we would make it something which was in an orbit that wasn't impossible to reach, um, but would need a big international effort to do it. Uh, and we'd make it of a size and composition that wasn't impossible to deal with in the time, nor too easy, not a loose pile of rubble that would fly apart. Probably an H-bomb would suffice for that. Um, but a solid lump of chondritic rock, uh, a part of the crust of a larger body that had been shattered in a collision. And in, uh, as we had it, uh, an orbit similar to the orbit of Enki's Comet. We'll talk more about that in a moment. As regards the current state of affairs, the big change that happened during the project was that at the end of its main deep space observations, the WISE probe, at the point when its cooling fluid um, ran out, essentially, and it could no, no longer do the uh, the very sensitive measures of infrared radiation from, from deep space, was turned over for a while to searching the solar system for relatively warm objects, of which it found a lot. And it's reckoned that at the end of the WISE survey, uh, a very, more than, something on the order of 96, 97 percent it may be even 98% of the objects bigger than a kilometer in diameter in the solar system, in our solar system, had been detected. Um, and roughly half of the ones, 500 to 1,000 meters in diameter. But the smaller they get, the smaller the percentage. There's still a lot of dangerous stuff out there. And we haven't even found all, all the big ones. Um, chondritic rock. Um, early solar system material, but not the earliest, that's carbonaceous chondrites. Um, dense, um, has bodies embedded in it of very early solar system material that are the chondrites that give these the, the name. And as I said, we reckoned something on approximately an orbit like Enki's Comet. Enki's Comet is one of the short period comets. It comes back every three and a half years. It's been observed for a couple of centuries. Um, but we didn't want we didn't want it to be going as close to the sun as that, not to be in retrograde orbit. Um, uh, Enki's orbit's uh, direct, but it does go very close to the sun. Um, we reckoned we needed its uh, perihelion to be considerably nearer to the Earth's orbit but with the same kind of orbital period. And Dr. David Asher from Amar Observatory, who took part in our seminar, said, yes, these do exist. In fact, 2011 AG5, which he had helped to discover when he was working in Japan, um, has almost exactly the orbit that we're talking about. So in this scenario, 
we're going to get three shots at dealing with the asteroid. It's going to hit us in 10 years' time, and uh, we'll, be, we'll get two chances, three chances, if you count the final approach, to do something about it. Uh, with that diameter and composition, if it does strike, it'll be roughly equivalent to the formation of the Nordlinger ring in Germany, uh, which has an entire city inside it now. Um, it's a continent buster. Um, it, it's going it, if it land, if it hits land, though you'll have a, co a continent sterilized with global environmental effects from the material thrown up into the atmosphere. Um, as it happened, I'd done a story for the Lance McLean strip about a roughly equivalent object uh, hitting the Pacific off Easter Island. Uh, so I was able to use these illustrations in the, in the book. Um, there happened to be a, a probe being tested off Easter Island, which was going to be sent to the surface of Venus, so it survived the impact. Not much else would. So, so uh, one of our principal advisors on this early, early formation of the scenario was Jay Tate of Space Guard UK, seen here with uh, Sir Martin Rees when he was uh, Astronomer Royal. Um, that's the Space Guard Observatory, the only one even now in the world dedicated entirely to the search for hazardous objects. Um, and Jay told us that uh, uh, he gave he gave a talk uh, at our seminar and he gave an update at the uh, 2012 second seminar. Um, uh, he reckoned that the incoming hazard was most likely to be detected by the Pan Stars observatories on Hawaii, uh, which were built to search for potentially hazardous objects, though a lot of the time is now spent on other things. They discovered comets. Uh, uh, this is a photograph by our good friend Dr. Alan Kalis, taken at Stirling Observatory, of one of the first pan-star comets in 2013. Just nice time for the book. Um, the reports would go initially to the Minor Planet Centre at Cambridge, Massachusetts, who would immediately want uh, studies of the potentially hazardous object. And we might get lucky and people might actually find the time to look at it. Particularly uh, effective will be if it can be studied by radar, if it's discovered in enough time to arrange that, either using the Goldstone um, antenna and part of NASA's deep space network, or the Aris huge bowl at Arecibo in Puerto Rico, with which it often works in concert. Uh, and there is a specialized radar being developed by NASA called Kaboom, uh, interesting acronym, um, photographed here by Ken, uh, Ken Kramer at, um, at Goldstone. Um, that radar is designed specifically to look, not so much to look for as to follow up and determine the object the orbits of potentially hazardous objects. And what you get in that situation, going back to the uh, probable ev ev evolution of the seminar last year, is progressively accurate determinations, where initially it seems as if the object could hit the Earth. And finally, if you're lucky, it turns out that it won't. We are looking at a scenario where the Earth stays stubbornly right in the middle of that central ellipse. To do that, it has to go through um, a point in space called the keyhole. Um, if an object is tracked going through that, it is going to hit the Earth. Um, if not on its next pass around the Sun, then shortly. And that's the scenario we've got with our asteroid, which we had taken by this time to call it Goldilocks, because it's neither too big nor too small, too far away or too near um, for the purposes of our discussion. Um, the likely political reaction to it was assessed for us by Limit OPIC MP, 
one of the very few MPs who has taken any interest in this subject at all. Uh, there he is lecturing in Space Guard year before we started this. And he gave us a very interesting assessment of what would happen, which basically was that governments would throw money at it in order to counter the claims, as with more recent events, that they should have been prepared for this before it happened. They'd throw huge amounts of money at it and then sit on their hands and do nothing else. That was that was his prediction, though he, he made it in considerably more detail, but that was that was what it came down to. So um, we are not looking at a scenario here where uh, the nuclear option is, is our first choice. It may be tried in desperation later. Um, one of the other ways of deflecting a hazardous object uh, that has attracted a lot of attention lately is the Yarkovsky effect, um, first hypothesized by a Russian civil engineer, uh, Ivan Yarkovsky, 1844 to 1902. Um, his findings were afterwards publicized by Ernst Opik, the grandfather of Lembit Opik, a very distinguished ast astronomer who got Lembit interested in it in his childhood. What it involves is the side of your object facing towards the sun at any given moment is heating up. And as it rotates on its axis, um, that heat gets radiated off uh, from, as it says here, the afternoon side of the asteroid. It creates a thrust, a very low thrust. This is a long, slow way of deflecting an asteroid or even a comet if it was far enough from the sun not to be active. Um, but it has very real possibilities if you've got time to do it. Um, and I came across a nice picture quite recently, which I would have used if I'd, had, I'd have sought permission to use this if it had been available. There is a probe painting an asteroid, and it's doing it in the form of an appropriate message. Go away, which is what we would like it to do. Not quite as slow, but undoubtedly effective if you've got time to do it, is the gravity tractor effect, um, uh, which has been um, essentially studied by a couple of ex-astronauts who have yeah, definitely come up with something here that is extremely interesting. If you've got a spacecraft with long duration, low, low thrust engines and sufficient mass to do it, then over time, without, uh, without physically touching the asteroid, it can tow it away or at least to a path that would remove it from uh, potential impact. But uh, to give typical figures, if you had a spacecraft weighing seven, um, I think it's about four tons, it would take 20 years to move an asteroid a kilometer across by the diameter of the Earth. So uh, you do need lots of time for that one, which is not available in our Golden Oaks scenario another illustration of it and we're going to come back to that later. Uh, a, a diagram from from the original paper illustrating the principle. Your spacecraft has to be stationed far enough out for the angled jets not to impinge on the asteroid itself. Otherwise you'll undo all your good work and, and it'll remain on the trajectory it had in the first place. So uh, coming round now to ideas that we had and had had in the meantime that we wanted to look at in more depth. The late John Braithwaite, who was my second in command on the uh, Stone Circle project and afterwards became the last telescope maker in Scotland, had worked as a consultant in the mid-1980s with Dr Peter Waddle's team at Strathclyde who made the first major breakthrough in what what's now called adaptive optics. Working on a budget of a shoestring, 
they solved what had been called the Loch Ness Monster of Astronomy, uh, the creation of a flexible mirror which would retain a parabolic focus as the focal length was altered. Um, this was the big one they made, of which John gave me a confidential demonstration at Strathclyde when they first did it. And this is typical in this illustration of the, the shoestring nature of the budget. Uh, that they were determining its its focal length at that point using a broom handle <laughs> a spot uh, reflecting on the ceiling. Uh, meanwhile, of course, as soon as Strathclyde um, issued the patents, uh, Japanese optics companies got up and ran with it and started pouring very large sums of money. Um, they created uh, an optical table two miles long to study this, this effect. And of course, other breakthroughs in flexible optics followed. Um, so the flexible mirror is not at the moment the one that's mostly being pursued in, in astronomy. But Gordon Ross, a colleague of mine, another past president of Astra in the Industrial Design Unit at Glasgow School of Art, came up with the design in 1986. Um, He'd already designed a parabolic solar sail called Solaris, and he wedded it to the Strathclyde flexible mirror to create a system. It's elaborate. It's a tertiary mirror that actually does the generation of the beam, which, but you can collect an awful lot of sunlight and focus it onto the asteroid or comet and, and, get a, and produce a jet and you can control the process, you can adjust its rotation, you can adjust its orbit, and with sufficient time. It, um, uh, uh, and you're talking a lot less time than the other scenarios I've just mentioned. You could potentially save the Earth. Um, uh, no. Um, um, Gordon Fett. Uh, favoured the mirror that was, uh, it sh whose shape was controlled by guy lines and semi-rigid bracing on the on the back. Uh, John preferred a solution which involved putting a clear membrane over the mirror and pressurising it so that the transparent surface would be convex and the the reflecting surface would be concave. Uh, this does have some major advantages, as I'm going to point out in a moment. Um, Gordon taking that idea and putting it together with design on designs of elliptical radio antennae for spacecraft that were being studied by the Jet Propulsion Laboratory at the time, came up with this device, the Archimedes complex of four mirrors linked in a solid frame with the plume coming coming out, the debris plume coming off the asteroid passing between them. Uh, here we come to a crucial point. Uh, this is Professor, as you know, is Max Vasili, who was then at Glasgow University and is now at Strathclyde. Um, he shared his thoughts on, uh, uh, he'd set up an asteroid deflection project and we had an exchange of ideas. And he decided that our idea was the best one, except that he was worried about the complexity of the focus, focusing mechanism. He reckoned that with a bigger sail, um, you could have it standing off at a greater distance from the asteroid um, and you wouldn't need uh, the multi-mirror chain that Gordon had designed. Um, he then took it to the optics department at Glasgow Uni University, who demonstrated that you could never get a good enough focus that way uh, without building a mirror of impossible size and operating it from at least 10, mi 10 miles away. Um, so instead, uh, he came up with what he called the mirror bees concept of using multiple mirrors closer in. Um, I certainly felt that he painted himself into a corner with this, that he had, we'd given him a, a design with a, a, 
a very effective focusing mechanism. The first thing he did, first thing he did was remove the entire focusing mechanism and then complain that it wouldn't focus, which struck me as pretty silly. Um, because now he was in trouble. The mirror bees had to be really close to the asteroid. The prospect of damage from the ejector plume coming off was significant. And in fact, when I went to the Association of Space Explorers uh, to talk, one of my aims was to talk to Rusty Schweikart, the Apollo 9 astronaut who's taken a great interest in all of this. And he just laughed in my face. He wouldn't listen to what I had to say. He said, it's already been totally disproved. The mirror concept is useless. It'll be ripped to shreds by the ejector plume in minutes. You're just wasting my time. And he, he wouldn't discuss it further. He just went on laughing at me till I went away. Um, however, Max, now this it turned out when we, when we looked into it. Um, the paper making these assertions had been written by a couple of Chinese um, optical experts who had come to these conclusions. Um, and um, Max decided to put it to the test. Um, and he set up a, a set of experiments to put it to the test. This is the scenario that he's trying to show whether it's valid or not. You've got your asteroid being hit by the beam from the middle B um, and the plume being generated. Um, the question is what's going to happen to the mirror B as a result? Uh, is it going to be destroyed by the plume? Because all the other questions become irrelevant if it's only going to survive for a matter of minutes. And when he moved to Strathclyde, he decided to look into it. What particularly concerned him is, was the plume going to have the shape of a rocket exhaust in air? like this one during Project NERVA, the US nuclear Mars mission intended for 1986, of which more and on. Um, was it going to be like that? Um, or was it going to be more diffuse as a rocket plume is at high altitude? This is a launch of a Soyuz photograph from the ground and captured shortly before the solid boosters burn out. Uh, uh, and are discarded, but it's even at, even at that stage, the plume is already much more jellyfish shaped. And indeed, there was a time when the Soviet Union tried to cover up uh, spy satellite launches from their secret cosmo co cosmodrome at Plesetsk um, by saying they're jellyfish UFOs, and they set up jellyfish UFO societies to study them. Um, that is the restart of a satellite called LeSat, which, whose booster failed to light in orbit after it had been released from the space shuttle. On a subsequent mission, the astronauts went up with appropriate tools and hot-wired it, and that is the ignition of, of the LeSat once its booster had been, had been made to fire. And you can see the beginnings here of much wider jellyfish plume, illustrated in this picture of the Nerva Mars mission setting off on its way home. So what, so what essentially Max Vasily wanted to find out with, a, with cubes of various types of rock and other materials being fired at by a laser um, was, and the thing suspended on a, on a wire, what would happen? What, obviously, some reaction was going to take place, but what shape would the plume be? And what he found out was, um, having filled his test chamber with nitrogen so he wouldn't start the fire in the process, uh, he got an effect very much like a rocket motor at ground level when the laser beam hit his rock sample. But in vacuum, got a very much tighter, narrower beam. and so he studied the proper properties of this plume in detail, and he discovered that it, uh, the outer regions of it were moving comparatively slowly. Um, and they didn't stick 
two surfaces that he positioned to catch it. Um, they could very easily be shaken off. Um, so what uh, Gordon and John came up with as a result was a design like John's space mirror with the concave and convex surfaces, but equipped um, with the means to sugar the transparent surface and shake the dust off. And they reckoned that since, it, since the particles would be impacting on it at low speed, they wouldn't be likely to penetrate it. It could be made self-sealing in any case. And they reckoned that the Chinese objections that Rusty Spikert had taken so seriously simply didn't apply. Um, however, they were also taking a leaf out of Max Vasily's book. John favoured having uh, a lens mechanism, super, a lens essentially built into the transparent surface, which could be in, whose focus could independently be changed. But the other option, of course, was simply to use the collected energy um, to fire a laser through through along the main axis. You could either have an up sun or a down sun, sun version. They designed both. And they built a prototype. And at our 2012 seminar, which we held in the Brady Library at Glasgow University Union, Gordon is demonstrating it with an arrow slit uh, through the heavy curtains which are closed. That's him lining it up. And there it is firing. Um, and the, the laser, um, which they uh, were powering just off a part of this very small dish, was generating enough power that he had to keep moving it around because it was hot enough to ignite paper. Not something you wanted to do when we were guests in the library. So um, nevertheless, the point was, it was a very clear demonstration that it worked. Uh, at that point, John Braithwaite, donated to Chris O'Kane and Gordon, who had actually built this. He donated the big mirror to them, uh, I showed them earlier, the 36-inch 36, 36 inch one, um, so that they could build a much larger flying demonstrator. Uh, but then John himself died, and his contributions to this exercise were, were vital, so nothing more came of it, as Chris O'Kane said afterwards. If you have a good idea, get on with it. You may not have next year. The, anyway, the satellites, the, the, the probes, we call them what you will, which we're going to launch better than mirror bees um, and more sophisticated than the original Solaris Comet Chaser. Um, they're going to be launched um, in com groups um, folded up in the nose cone of the carrier rockets, like the tracking and data relay satellites used um, by, in the, initially in the space shuttle program and now generally in NASA efforts, uh, which open up like that once they're on station. Um, and, uh, you know, you could, they're small, they're lightweight, uh, you could launch a lot of them, you could, probably get the whole program together in, a, in a, a year or so, a year or two, and get them out to the asteroid at its first pass three, point year, three years after the initial one when it went through the keyhole. And there will be time. You've got 6.6 .6 years. You can try different strategies. It could be the equivalent of the Douglas Bader's big wings in the Battle of Britain. There'll be a lot of argument about what the most effective way is to use them. And there is only one potential problem which continues to bug me. The asteroids that we have photographed by spacecraft close up, this is Gaspar, the first one which was photographed by the Galileo spacecraft. That's how it looks optically. But in uh, ultraviolet, you could actually see through the covering of dust and pebbles to a much more solid, heavily cratered sub surface underneath. My only worry with the mirror scenario is that we could just find ourselves blasting the dust cover off the asteroid 
Um, even if we penetrate into the crust and form a trench, which is what Gordon thought would happen, which would focus the, the beam still or the, uh, the plume, um, are, are we actually going to change the orbit of the asteroid or are we simply going to compress it and heat up its interior? Um, there's no real way to find that out except to try it with something big enough in space to, to if be effectively uh, give us answers to these questions. It may work, but if it doesn't work, we need a plan B. Um, and since the asteroid's coming back 6.6 .6 years after detection and 3.3 .3 years between, um, before impact, we have got a time scale comparable to Project Apollo in which to get something much bigger and tougher out there. That brings us to the end of the first part of this presentation. We're now coming up on the second uh, perihelion of the asteroid, 6.6 .6 years after discovery, 3.3 .3 years approximately to go to the impact. Our first, for the sake of argument in, in this presentation, we're assuming that the attempt to deflect the asteroid with mirror collectors has not worked. We have, in the meantime, obviously had an intensive effort to prepare for plan B and uh, that's what we'll be talking about in part two. See you then.